Imagine trying to brush your teeth, but not being able to pick up your toothbrush. Crazy, or having trouble swallowing and even breathing. These are just a few things that a person with myasthenia gravis can experience. To understand the emotional and physical toll this disease can take, let's meet Kathy, who's sharing her story. So let's go behind the mystery. I started to believe there was something wrong with me more than just old age or weight is when I was getting more tired and had f quite profound weakness. Matter of fact, one day I drove home from work and I could not get my foot off the brake pedal. The only way I could do it was to lift my leg with my hands. And the next morning when I went to blow dry my hair, I could not hold the blow dryer. So that led me to go to um, a physician who uh, ultimately diagnosed me with myasthenia gravis. So I could tell you that I had symptoms of MG eight years prior to diagnosis. One of the most profound examples I had was I had gone out boating with friends and I got out and to go in the water, but I could not get myself back up the ladder. I didn't have the strength in my arms to pull myself back up that ladder. And then I noticed that walking down to the cafeteria at the hospital where I worked became so much of a task that I was no longer getting my afternoon coffee. I was being robbed slowly over the years, but I didn't know who the robber was. with neurologist Dr. Habib from UCI Health to understand more about what Kathy was experiencing. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune neurological disorder which affects the muscles and the way our body is able to move them. The word myasthenia literally means muscle weakness and the word gravis refers to the gravity of the disease as we have known it historically. Myasthenia can affect an individual at any time in their life. It tends to affect younger uh, adult women and more frequently older adult men in the disease spectrum. The nerve and muscle, they form a functional continuum and there is a critical step for the nerve signal to go to the muscle and that is via the release of a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine and the autoimmune basis of the disease results in interruption of this communication between the nerve and muscle. And this is what results in weakness in the muscle. The classic features in myasthenia start often uh, with involvement of the eyes. And what this may look like to a person is drooping of their eyes as well as double vision. And other areas in the body that can be affected with myasthenia can include muscles in the face, so weakness with smiles, being able to keep your mouth closed when you're doing things like drinking water, weakness in your tongue muscles so that your speech is affected and your swallowing can be affected. It can also affect the muscles in the upper and lower extremities. It can affect the breathing muscles and when it affects muscles of breathing or swallowing, that usually signals a more significant disease burden. And that's what really alarms us in terms of the potential for what we refer to as myasthenic crisis. Accepting the fact that you have a life altering diagnosis is difficult. And so you go through a grief process because you've lost who you thought you were gonna be. I had just gotten my master's degree and I was so proud of that. And it wasn't but a few months when I could no longer work. And seeing my diploma really was so depressing to me. And I was like, I have no purpose. I'm just sitting here and I have no purpose. The first time I had an MG crisis, I was getting more exhausted, more fatigued, profound weakness, harder to walk harder to chew, and thank goodness I had a home health nurse that came in and recognized right away those symptoms. And um, by the time I got to the hospital, I was on a ventilator within moments. My doctor told me, had my home health nurse not sent me to the hospital and not been at my house that day, I probably would not have survived. When I had my crisis, it definitely changed my experience with MG. It was 
definitely because I didn't know how to manage my MG. It also had a large component to do with my denial about it, me not taking the rest breaks, me not doing the things I needed to do to ensure my own safety. I knew at one point I had to get to the point of acceptance and I learned that I had to educate myself about MG. So I did a lot of research. I joined an MGFA support group and within that support group, I have found some of my best friends and that really helped me that I've got this disease. Yes, my life is different, but it doesn't mean it's a bad life. When we come back, the importance of having an open dialogue with your physician when managing myasthenia gravis. Welcome back to Behind the Mystery of Myasthenia Gravis. Once the diagnosis of myasthenia is suspected, confirmation of the diagnosis comes by doing antibody testing. The majority of patients have an antibody to the acetylcholine receptor. However, patients can have antibodies to other parts of the neuromuscular junction. Furthermore, in some patients, none of these antibodies are positive and that can make diagnosing myasthenia a challenge. Another way that we confirm the diagnosis is by actually studying the physiology between that nerve and muscle communication, the most common form of which is referred to as repetitive nerve stimulation. It is so hard not to have control of your own body. And with myasthenia gravis, I could wake up in the morning and be fine. And by afternoon, I could not be able to function. I lost the ability to easily socialize with friends, to drive most days because my eyesight is affected. I lost the ability to you know, cook for myself or cook for my family. So now I had to rely on my support network for everything. Asking for help is so difficult. I was always the helper. I was always the one to be the caregiver. And so when the role was reversed, it felt like I'd lost my independence and it, it felt to me like I'd lost some of my dignity. It's very important for, for patients to have an open discussion with their physicians to bring across to the forefront what they actually need. My first question is usually, what is your biggest challenge uh, as you uh, live your life? What is the one thing that if I can improve will make your life a lot better? What I know about the disease is what I observe and, and read. What the patient knows about the disease is what they live through. So getting on the same page is extraordinarily important. Myasthenia gravis is what we call a snowflake disease. No two patients are exactly the same. So the management of these patients should be individualized to meet their individual needs. So during my visit, I usually ask about the degree of weakness the patient is experiencing. What is your biggest challenge as you go through the course of your day? And which one is the most severe? I also ask about how they currently manage the disease. What treatment have you used in the past and how that have affected your symptoms and where can we go from here? I did have to come to the point where I did have those honest conversations with my doctor and stopped hiding the fact that I was weak and that I was having difficulty in my day-to-day -day activities, even brushing my teeth. And that was a difficult thing to do, but I think that's the best way to manage your MD is that 100% honesty. Um, it, it took a meltdown for me to finally have that communication with my doctor. And it was over buying peaches, that I couldn't pick out my own peaches at a grocery store, and how profoundly sad that made me. And it was after that meltdown that I, I became a better communicator with my physician. Like, I, I have control of this I'm disease. This disease does not have control of me. The first and foremost principle with the treatment of myasthenia gravis is it requires a lot of communication and frequent communication between the treating physician and the patients. There are several different aspects to the treatment and management of myasthenia gravis. And all of these together give us a bigger toolbox for the treatment and management of myasthenia gravis. So options for management can include symptomatic treatment. And then if that's not adequate, we go to immunosuppression. And that can include steroids or non-steroid immunosuppressants. For short-term quick response, we often use plasma exchange and also IVIG. 
Other options include thymectomy for younger patients, but the effect doesn't come on uh, at least for several months or years. Uh, so that is something that we plan for the long term. Up until 2017, we had one treatment that was approved by the FDA, and that was back in 1955. A tremendous amount of, of clinical trials and research are going on in this space. Coming up, Kathy will be joining us in the studio along with a key member of the UCB team. Behind the Mystery, we'll be right back. Welcome back to The Balancing Act presents Behind the Mystery of Myasthenia Gravis. We're joined in the studio by MG patient and advocate Kathy, along with Kim Moran, Senior Vice President and Head of Rare Diseases at UCB. Welcome, ladies. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Show. Kim, as we saw in Kathy's story, MG can be kind of a roller coaster ride for a lot of people. What does UCB learn from the community? Well, the first thing is to lean in and to listen. What we learned about myasthenia gravis, and we continue to learn from working with people like Kathy, is that symptoms change. And that unpredictability of living with myasthenia gravis is difficult. There's a high burden with the disease. So as an organization, our tagline at UCB is inspired by patients and driven by science. And we take that very seriously. That inspiration of patients is listening, leaning in, and working with people like Kathy to understand their journey. Kathy, it's been five years since you were diagnosed. Can we talk about some of those difficulties that you faced? Things had drastically changed. I wasn't able to work anymore. I had to give up my career due to weakness, um, vision changes. It was very hard for me to reach out and ask for help. Um, I was always the helper, and now I was the one asking for help. My daughter became my caregiver and advocate, and it's very hard for a parent to ask a child to give up a portion of their life of to take care of you. So um, it's been a difficult journey and not knowing anybody else with MG made it even worse. And Kim, how is UCB responding to the unmet needs of patients? We have created a patient panel in which we have about a dozen people living with myasthenia gravis that we have the opportunity to do patient listening sessions where we'll bring a topic or two and gain feedback. Like, does this make sense? Does this resonate with you? One of the things that we continue to hear is about the individualized experience, treating each person living with myasthenia gravis as an individual. And with that, we were able to take that insight and create impact. We created a new role called a care coordinator. These are individuals that work directly with people living with myasthenia gravis to help them reach their individualized goals. Kathy, you are now a co-leader of an MG group. At the beginning, you were a patient, so um, kudos to you. Thank How you. has that impacted your life? It's made such a difference. Being a co-leader of a support group has given me a lot of purpose. And when I was diagnosed and I didn't have anyone to talk to or uh, knew anybody with the disease, I think it made it much more difficult. So I can only hope I'm a person out there for somebody who's newly diagnosed um, so they can learn about the disease and they know that they aren't alone. But I also want to make patients know that they're not a burden and that even though we have MG, we still have a lot to offer this world. And I could just hope that everybody can dial into a support system that teaches them that. And it's so nice to go out there to the community and say, you know, treatments are changing. The pharmaceutical companies are listening. They want to know our story. Partnerships and collaborations are really imperative to the MG community, right? So how has that impacted both of you? So one of the concepts that we like to talk about is co-creation. So how can we work as a company, being UCB, but also working with patient support groups like the one that Kathy runs? So we work together on similar problems. What are the needs? What do we need to create at the end of the day? One of the examples is not everyone in the US, their first language is English. So we've created bilingual patient support materials for those that speak English or Spanish. Another component of that is also not only do we need to support the individual living with myasthenia gravis, but caregivers is an unmet need, is an area that needs more support, more materials, more tools so that they can help their loved ones. I always say, the caregiver has myasthenia also, they just don't have the physical symptoms, but they live with the limitations of the disease and the fear of the unknown. 
just like the patient does. Wow. Kathy, I want to end with you. How important is it to just be part of all the insights? Working with pharmaceutical companies and working with other patients lets you know that you can live with this disease. You can still be happy as a patient with myasthenia, or actually, as I like to say, as a person with myasthenia. Ladies, thank you so much. Still to come, Dr. Vu will be joining our conversation. And Behind the Mystery will continue when we come back. Welcome back to Behind the Mystery of Myasthenia Gravis. Dr. Vu, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, yeah. Doctor, let me ask something. Earlier in the show, you discussed the importance of an open dialogue between doctor and patients. What have you learned about myasthenia gravis from your patients? First of all, uh, as you can see from uh, Kathy here, that they're the most resilient and adaptable people that you're ever going to want to see. Um, but they also want to be informed. They want to be involved. They want to, to have a seat at the table. And it, uh, they push us to be, uh, you know, well versed in our uh, specialty and, and also in what's going on in the world of Mycenae Gravis. And that's why a lot of us are involved in clinical trials to push the ball forward and to give them possible care. Mm. And Kim, you know, a lot of times, especially with this one, patients are caught in what they call an infinity loop. Now, what is that and what's UCB doing to help with that? Sure. An infinity loop is when a patient gets stuck. They get stuck in their clinical journey. So you can imagine maybe they're on therapy and it's not working. They go back, they get given the same therapy and they keep going back and forth and not moving along in their treatment journey. So what's really interesting about healthcare today is that it's so data rich. We can actually analyze a population of myasthenia gravis patients, understand where are they getting stuck that they're getting stuck for months and not moving on either from when they have symptoms before diagnosis or when they're trying to reach their optimal treatment. So at UCB, we have a patient first as well as a digital first approach in which we can use that plethora of data and analytics to help us understand where the unmet needs are in the patient journey and help advocate and help them move on to improve time to diagnosis, as well as time to optimal treatment. What impact, Doctor, do patient programs have on the patients you see? Oh, highly positive. They come in very well informed, mm -hmm. and so we start our conversation at a much higher level than we would have otherwise. And, and that certainly facilitate care and, and, you know, make my life a lot easier and more efficient. So, Kathy, I mean, what would you say to a patient who's been newly diagnosed to help them with their journey? do your research, make sure it's credible research. And you'll know that that first few years is truly the toughest. It's when you're learning your body and what's happening to it. And your physician's also learning you and learning how to treat you. There's so much more going on with MG research and MG patient programs. So don't give up hope, keep pushing through, keep reaching out for support and making sure you're dialed into as many programs as you can so that you feel that you are supported through this journey. Thank you all so much for sharing what you shared today. I know our viewers are really going to love this. Wishing you the very best. And Kathy, thank you for what you're doing. Of course, if you'd like more information, you can visit ucb-usa.com. And of course, you can always go to our website, thebouncingact.com. We'll see you next time.